Canaan Christian Church, a simple church with a kingdom focus. With our pastor, Dr. Walter Malone Jr., we dare to dream, connecting one with God and one with one another. We teach the Word of God through Connection Group and Wednesday Bible Studies. The Word of God is declared and celebrated each Sunday morning. Through prayer, we build our relationship with God and one another. We proclaim the Word of God locally and globally. The Canaan Christian Church is a great church because we glorify God and seek to spiritually edify the people of God. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the Word of God. Good morning. Good morning to everyone and welcome to our Connection Group Bible Study. I greet you with the joy of the Lord. I greet you in the most high name of the person in the Lord Jesus, the Christ, our Savior. So excited that everyone has joined us this morning and we're going to go before the Lord in prayer and we will open up our study. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we bless you and praise you and thank you and give your glory because you're worthy, God. We honor you, God, because of who you are. We thank you, God, because of what you've done. We worship you, God, because of who you are. And for that, God, we give you the praise. Now, God, have your way in our time of study and fellowship and engaging one with another. I thank you, God, that even through our virtual study, God, that we are able to connect by your spirit. And for that, God, we bless you and praise you. You. I thank you, God, for everyone who has joined us this morning and pray that they are blessed by your word. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we do pray and we give you the thanks. Let everyone say amen. Amen. Excited, excited, excited. This lesson that we are on today is an exciting one and um, we have a lot to cover. So we want to welcome those, excuse me, we certainly want to welcome those of you who have joined us through our, our YouTube or our Canaan streaming broadcast ministry platforms. We want to welcome our virtual members and our covenant partners. Those of you that are worshiping uh, with us who are visiting, we welcome you into our Canaan members who are not able to be in in the sanctuary. Thank you for being a part of our study on today. Today's lesson is, of course, we're still in Mark and we're in Mark chapter three, but today's lesson, we did not cover um, these particular verses in our last study of the book of Mark. So, and I want to say that this might be the first time that we have actually covered these verses. And so the study on today is entitled Questioned question and we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 3 verses um, 20 through 30. Mark chapter 3 verses 20 through 30. Now I may not necessarily reference the memory verse slash key verse in our teaching as such so let me do it now and that's going to be verse number 24. Certainly we will teach that verse but it is um, noted as our memory verse. Now the main idea for our teaching today is that Jesus has authority over all creation including Satan. We need to get that early. Jesus has authority over all creation, including Satan. And the key word out of that statement is the word authority. I need y'all to circle it, underline it, highlight, do what you need to do so that as we make our way through these verses, that we keep the main thing, the main thing, because there are two or three things happening here in these verses that make up our focal text but we want to make sure that we stay focused on the main idea for our teaching come on we, we already know that the word um, it, the revelation of the word is what the revelation of the word is how we apply that could be different Amen. But we want to stay close to the main idea related to authority in our teaching today. And the reason is that, you know, this is Mark's gospel. Mark has written this particular gospel. But what this does, and the title of the lesson is questioned, right? 
it raises questions. There are questions that are being raised throughout um, the text um, of Jesus's authority and the extent of his authority. Now, we have seen, this is also part of the context as well, but we have seen, um, even in the first uh, couple of chapters, because of course, Mark jumps off the gate presenting Jesus as the eternal son of God. And we see Jesus having authority over death, authority authority over demons, authority over sickness, right? Disease, if you want to keep the alliteration going, death, uh, demons, and disease. But what we will see in our text um, as we begin to open up is the question about where the authority comes from and how he has uh, derived the power that he has. Now, what we want to do is as we go throughout this lesson, we should become um, still for a moment, introspective, if you will, because we need to consider for ourselves individually and as the body of believers, what does Jesus's authority mean to us? What role does the authority of Jesus play in our own individual lives? And we might want to stop and really kind of take stock of where we have allowed Jesus's authority to reign in our lives. But then also, what area of our lives have we kind of, you know, said, Jesus, I got this. God, I, I got this over. Yeah, I got this part. You handle that part. Mm -hmm. Meaning, God, I don't need your authority to reign in every area of my life. But there's a couple of areas that I might be maybe even uh, unbeknownst to myself without real prayerful consideration that I've allowed myself Mm, to take over the authority or deny him to walk in the authority that uh, is due him. And instead of surrendering that, that I handle that piece, that I'm in control of that area of my life. I think you all get the message. Let's go to the context. The context of our study covers Mark chapter 3, verse 7 through Mark chapter 5, verse 43. And certainly, of course, we know we won't be covering all of that. But the beginning part of the context is really what's going to be crucial for us. Um, and starting in verse number seven, however, uh, we can't cover this, but we need to jump to the beginning of chapter three because be the beginning of chapter three of Mark describes um, Jesus healing the man with the withered hand. I believe that's in John's gospel around uh, chapter five in John's gospel as he is written. And the reason that I'm mentioning that part of the beginning of the book is because it is in verse number six, after Jesus heals the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath, Y'all remember that when we were in John, because we talked about that uh, pretty detailed. We covered that. But he heals the man with the withered hand. He heals him on the Sabbath, which really, what are we saying there in that part of the context? What we're saying is that, that Jesus exemplified and walked out the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law because Jesus chose to have compassion on this man rather than saying it's the Sabbath so I won't heal him. And verse 6 then tells us that the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. This is the line of demarcation. This is the point where the Pharisees have made a determination, mm -mm, he got to go. No, he's doing too much. He's overstepped his boundary and authority. And Jesus is now, as we're in the context, and we've seen it in chapter one, and we definitely saw it in chapter two, where Jesus's popularity is on the rise. Jesus's reputation has taken off. In a word uh, that we typically describe, whether you're younger or older, you hear the phrase, you know, he's blown up. 
she's blowing up. Well, Jesus was all the way blown up because of the miracles that he had been performing. He had followers upon followers upon followers. That is important for our context and where we are going for our focal text. So what we want to glean from this, verses 1 through 6, we have the man's hand healed um, in, the, in, the, in the sanctuary on the Sabbath, but then we have where our context starts in verse number seven. In verse number seven, so verses seven through 12, basically, where the multitudes, this is what we have to get, there were thousands upon thousands, could possibly be, possibly even have been tens of thousands, but a great number of people had been following Jesus. It is described in our word as the multitudes, right? So Jesus leaves the disciples to go to the sea, and even from there, there was a great multitude of people from Galilee that continued to follow him because of, all, listen, verse 7, hearing all that he was doing. So he was trying to get out, because remember even last week we talked about Jesus was trying to get away, right? Steal away, but they came to him in great numbers from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, uh, uh, beyond the Jordan. So he, they just kept coming. They just kept coming. So much so that Jesus told the, the disciples, he told the boys to get a boat ready because of the size of the crowd. Listen to how Jesus describes this. This is important. In verse number nine, he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd so that they would not crush him. That is a description of not just how many people were in the crowd, but how the, the crowd was moving and behaving because they were pushing in on him. We're getting ready to see it. We're getting ready to see it in just a moment. And then the other thing that I want us to see is the reason why the crowd, I said it, but let's read it in verse number 10. Why? Because or for he had cured many so that all who had diseases pressed upon him to touch him. They're trying to get close to Jesus. Reminds us of the woman with the issue of blood. However, put a pin here. I want you to see this in verse number 10. This is good. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and shouted, you are the son of God. But he sternly ordered them not to make him known. What did I just read? I didn't say it was the scribes, the Pharisees. I didn't even say it was the disciples. It was the unclean spirits. This is a testimony. The unclean spirits here are testifying to who Jesus was. I can't stay there. But we, we, we'll get it back in somewhere in the teaching. But that part right there ought to get our attention for where we're going. Then verses 13 through uh, 19, we will not go through those particular verses, but just be clear that between verses 13 through 19, Jesus appoints the 12 disciples. That gets us to our focal text. Understand Jesus's popularity is shot through the roof understand that now he has made enemies of the Pharisees and they are out to kill him and destroy him. Through all of that, even though uh, when he left Capernaum he, and he told the man that he healed with leprosy not to tell nobody because of the distractions that would come, but he told anyway. Jesus understood what was going to take place. And then when he made his way and they continued to make their way into Galilee, he still healed, he still cured of diseases, he's still sharing the gospel. Amen. So now we've got thousands of people coming at him and his ministry is growing. And as his ministry is growing, there are those in Jerusalem, the religious, uh, not religious, just religious, but the religious leadership in Jerusalem has got an issue. They want to find out what is it, how is it that this man is so powerful? They know who he is. 
I need somebody. They do. They, may act, they, they might act like they don't, but they understand who Jesus is, which is why they're seeking to kill him and destroy him because he's about to, 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 to take their sense of authority, their sense of position, their sense of power that they think that they have. Let's go ahead and move into our text because we're there, verse number 20. Um, and we may come back just a little bit, but what we're teaching includes the context. So we will be, uh, we'll be still with, within the context of what it is that we are teaching. First section is entitled Skeptics. Skeptics, Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 22. Jesus entered a house and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said, he's out of his mind. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub. He drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. First section is entitled, what? Skeptics. Skeptics. Very interesting. What I really find interesting that we already talked about through verses 1 uh, through 6 and then verse 7 through um, 12 that Jesus is trying to get away from the multitudes. And now um, as they've made their way, uh, he is trying to, uh, he has entered a home, presumably uh, the home of Peter, but that's not 100%, but presumably. And the crowd has followed him there. It says Jesus entered a house and the crowd gathered again. And there were so many people that Jesus couldn't eat, the disciples couldn't eat, the other followers could not even eat. Mm -hmm. When his family heard this, listen, they set out to restrain him because they said he's out of his mind. So there's a couple of things that, that we want to get out of all of these verses. Verse number 20, I can't stay there, but if we get, listen, Jesus is trying to eat. Jesus has been trying to rest. Jesus has, sto look, we've seen the example that Jesus is setting when he uh, tries to steal away, away from the crowd, away from the disciples to have intimate, private time with his father. That ought to be an example. Jesus didn't always fast. He, was, he had to eat sometimes too. He was fully divine, but he was also fully human. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. If Jesus takes the time to steal away, Way. We talked about that last week as it relates to prayer. Then why don't we? Help me, God. Help me. Help me. If Jesus is like, I got to eat. I got to fuel my body. He's been ministering and ministering and ministering. Why do we think that we can keep going and going and going and burning the candle at both ends? I'm not going to stay here. I know y'all want me to stop. Burning the candles at both ends. Thinking that we will be... Um, productive spiritually as we minister when we are working on depletion. I'm going to stop right there because I'm, I'm actually talking to myself. But as we go on in the text in verse number 21, his family. Now, the word for family, the Greek word for family is a little bit unclear, but it could be um, those with him. That's the description or his own people. So we're talking about family. I'm going to go ahead and shoot to the end of the chapter. If you go to verses 31 through 35, then Mark then gives us a clear description of who it is that he was talking about as it relates to Jesus's family, those with him or his own people. You could also have included um, friends that are like family. But these people that are considered his family, listen, heard this. Now, what does that tell us? So there's a lot here in verse number 21. So first of all, they heard this. They, they heard it because it had to be told to them by others who had been in Jesus's company or in his presence. Word got back to them. Why? Because his family, the immediate family, more the siblings, not Mary, his mother, he, she understood very clearly who Jesus was, but his brothers and his sisters, there was, they didn't have a clear understanding of 100% about who he was. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, as much as I can. But, but what happens is that his own people, those that were considered to be family, didn't understand who he was. And we know that. Why do we know that? Because they said he's out of his mind. They said he's berserk. They said he's insane. They said he is um, a fanatic. 
those are probably are a lunatic, some of the words that they possibly could have used to describe Jesus. But let's just look at this for about a minute and a half. We're talking about people that grew up with Jesus. Come on, somebody, y'all gonna get this in a minute. Um, grew up with Jesus, knew him back when. The only difference is, because I know you thinking about yourself back in the day, those that you used to run and hang with and y'all know what y'all did and all that. But the difference is, Jesus is and has always been God. So even when he was a baby, even when he was in the womb, even before he got here as an earthly being, he was always God. And so whatever he did, whether he was a toddler, mm, whether he was uh, a teenager, a preteen, a tween, anything, he was always perfect. That's good right there. And so can you imagine? He's Talk about being the odd child. I know we talk about having black sheep of the family, but this is the odd child, right? And so we don't know the background in totality. We can only surmise using our spiritual imagination, you know, what was going on in that particular household, right? Mary's saying, now listen, your brother is really special. <laughs> well, he's beyond special. He is God, right? So we, we, we use that as an understanding from where they're coming from. Let's be clear, when we hear the word uh, restrain, that's the word that um, Mark uses. In another translation, he uses the word they came and they seized him. They wanted to seize him, to take control, not because they didn't love him, but because they did love him. He was still their brother. They were in a posture of trying to protect him from all that what they had heard because now they're thinking that he is what? Out of his mind. So they want to gather him back, take him home, let him rest somewhere and put his feet up because they think that he is crazy because he claims to be God. Do y'all have that? I hope you do. And remember, remember at this point, they are not believers. At this point, they do not believe in him. That's important. Now, the beautiful part about it is, I think it's by the time you get near to the end of Mark's gospel, they do accept him as the Lord Jesus Christ. But here, he's, 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 he's brother, right? He, he, he's brother, and they're trying to protect him because they thought that maybe he was either, he's out of his mind, he's either a danger to himself or a danger to someone else. So they were just trying to, 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 to prevent him from hurting himself and, and, and try to contain, you know, and protect him from all what people were saying. Let's move on. Let's move on. Verse number 22. Here we go. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said he is possessed by Beelzebul. He drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. Now, when we look at this, the scribes, now what does the Bible tell us? They had come down from Jerusalem. These scribes were sent. These scribes were sent more than likely by the Pharisees and the religious leaders in Jerusalem to go, go down there to Capernaum and check out what this man is. Oh, he's in Galilee now. Check out what this man is doing because they had gotten the word. It got all the way back to Jerusalem and they wanted to know. They wanted to understand what is it that Jesus is teaching and what is it about these miracles and these signs that he has been performing? We hear this, but we need you to go down there and check it out and see for yourselves. Confirm it or deny it, but we need to know what's going on. And, and keep in mind that the scribes, the keepers of the law, had a great influence on the people of Jerusalem and the people outside of Jerusalem. So this, 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 this word of Jesus' popularity and all that he was doing in the region was spreading throughout the region very, very quickly. So they sent some delegates down to see what in the world is going on down there, right? So they're on their way to Capernaum. They've come to Capernaum to see, and they have seen, and they have witnessed. And their uh, assertion, their um, conclusion of the matter is he is possessed by Beelzebul. Now, just as a side note, so that we have a, a clearer understanding, because Beelzebul, otherwise known as Beelzebub in the Old Testament, 
um, was representative of the Bielsa bowl that's referred here in the New Testament is representative of the Lord of the dung or Lord of the flies because the flies that are always on top of the dung, right? And so this particular um, quote unquote reference ultimately is to describe Satan. And so, yes, it's describing Satan. And then that last line in verse number 22 says, by the ruler of the demon. So he is possessed by Beez, Beelzebul. He is possessed by the one who is working in, um, working with Satan, a demon. They're basically saying that Jesus is uh, filled with an unclean spirit or a what? Demon. Because they said what? He drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. The ruler of the demons, that being Beelzebub or Beelzebul in the Hebrew. And so mm, we're getting ready to see Jesus getting ready to deal with this in just a moment. But here's the problem. Here's the issue. The issue is that they have seen and they have witnessed Jesus's power, his authority. They have witnessed now the healing of disease, the um, delivering from demonic possession. He's seen those that have been um, saved from death. So they can't deny what has taken place because they know what has taken place. The actions of Jesus are real, clear, and amazing. What they then can do, which is the only thing left, is to cast doubt on the onus of the power and authority by which he then performs the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. They got to somehow be able to explain the supernatural power that is at work. And so either they're going to have to admit that it is from God, and he is God, or that it is from Satan, and that he's working in cahoots with Satan. It can't be both and. And so they choose to say that he is possessed by Beelzebul. Isn't that interesting? And let's, let me just tell you now, the lie continues. They continue and consistently maintain that once it was spoken, they couldn't go back on it. Remember what's at stake for them, and they don't want to potentially lose any ground that they believe that they have gained. So that's why, that's why they said he is possessed by Beelzebul. Let's go to the next section, and then we're going to bring this kind of together, because the next section is entitled, Strong Man, question mark. Strong man, that's going to be verses 23 through um, 27. And this is where, so now they've, they've spoken. Jesus enters this house. He can't eat. All of that is going on. The scribes come down from Jerusalem, and they, they make the determination that he's possessed by Beelzebul, that the way that he is driving out demons is by the ruler of the demons. Jesus says, starting in verse number 23, so he summoned them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? Verse 24, the key verse, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand and is finished. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Mm. Okay. We got a lot of ground to cover, so let me let me let me move. And I, I'm not sure which translation. It may be the new, new Revised Standard Version, but another way to read verse 23 is, "And he called them to himself." And he 
come here. That's Jesus. Come here. I, I need to talk to y'all because y'all are really tripping. I, that's, that's what it said. No, that's not what it said, but that's really what it means. Jesus summoned them and spoke to them in parables. And we know that parables are a form of teaching that Jesus um, used quite often, speaking wisdom words using typically everyday language or examples by analogy or comparison to give a clear understanding of the spirit spiritual revelation that it was that he was sharing. And so we know that G this isn't the first time that he used a parable, and it certainly won't be the last time that he uses a parable. But it helps to give understanding and clarity for things that may be deeper in their understanding, but using everyday language and examples to be able to understand what it is that he's teaching. Basically, basically, when it's presented, you won't be able to say that you don't understand. It's presented in a manner that it will enlighten us if we receive the revelation of the word. So the first parable is how can Satan drive out Satan? Now this is just a logical, plain, makes sense kind of statement or question that when you when the question is asked, you already know that that is an absurd question, right? How can Satan drive out Satan? That really doesn't make sense. Satan's not going, and I'm getting a little bit deeper, but Satan is not going to drive out a demon from someone because his purpose is to kill, steal, and destroy. Satan already knows he's lost. Satan already knows he does not have the victory. His only goal is to take as many with him as mm, he can. So Satan ain't trying to drive out Satan, right? If a king, so then Jesus uses some examples. So he says, how does, how can Satan drive out Satan? Then he gives some examples. Then he says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. He's saying, if Satan cannot drive out Satan, then he says, if a kingdom is infighting against itself, if a marriage, the people, all the, 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 the mom and the daddy, the husband and wife do is fight and argue, and they're always bat, bat, uh, batting heads, and they can't ever come together and come to a sense of a, agreement. They, they can't get to that place where two walk together that they must agree right if there's always in fighting how can they stand and the enemy is fine with that he's happy with that and at the end of the day we know the truth he don't care how he gets us he don't care how he takes you down or out just that he does so if a kingdom is divided against itself that kingdom cannot stand then he brings it a little closer to home and he says then if a house is divided against itself that house cannot stand example because we call ourselves family, but we show us a different side. Just let somebody die. And they just got, they got two, two nickels to rub together that somebody else wants. And maybe it ain't the nickel. Maybe it's the lamp. Maybe it ain't the lamp. It's the bracelet. And maybe it ain't the bracelet. It's the shoes. Maybe it ain't the shoes. It's... So we see how family acts sometimes in what typically is going to be the, the, the situation and the, the place where there should be some coming together, supporting one another, loving one another through a time of loss and grief. But instead, what are we doing? We're fighting against one another over stuff and things. And so that house cannot stand. So Jesus goes on to say, then he says, and if Satan opposes his, first he says, how can Satan drive out Satan? Don't make no sense. But then he says, and if Satan opposes himself, Look, and it gets that far some kind of way, and he is and is divided, he cannot stand. And he takes it a little bit further. Not only can he not stand, the result of all that is, and he is finished. There's no standing. He's done. He's finished. Right? But then in verse number 27, then we have a positive truth. The earlier was 
a, a question that was like that how can that be well it cannot now in verse number 27 he says but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless so it's possible but there's something that's got to happen before that can take place and Jesus says unless he first ties up the strong man then he can plunder his house well that is a, 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 a parable and it's an example for something well what is that an example of what is Jesus talking about he's given us these these statements that are clearly absurd they are self-evident statements they 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 are questions that you already know the answers to but what about this part at the end of verse number 27 what's he talking about I know what he's talking about if he's talking about coming to my house I, yeah you got to enter the strong man's house first you got to tie up Alan Lewis come on somebody first you're gonna have to take him out but if you take him out nine times out of ten I ain't gonna be able to do nothing <laughs> I'm done right if I'm with him then whoever comes in will be able to what plunder the house what is plunder plunder means it's you're taking something what by force similar to that word seize um, that we read when his family uh, was concerned about him and so they wanted to seize him right but that plundering has to do look seizing so specifically someone else's property uh-huh oftentimes that was a term that was used in battle for you know during that time of war and at the end of the war whomever was the victor would then plunder um the the camp of the city of that city or nation that had been defeated right so what we're saying here is that if the strong man if the strong man is bound then whomever is trying to take whatever they're trying to take will be able to do so but what is it here that Jesus is referring to as it relates to Satan because what he's saying is that Satan is the strong man in this uh, parable what is it what is it what is it what what is that he can plunder what is it that he's possessing it's the demons the demons and all the people that he was attempting to take away by the it's his kingdom so what are we talking about we're talking about we're talking about Jesus saying the authority that I have is greater than that of the authority that what uh, the enemy has he's saying there is I've been preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God the advancement of his kingdom I've come to move the kingdom from one degree and level of experience to the next which is what the kingdom has to do with souls that are saved and what he says here is that if you enter the strong man's house you gotta bind him up now you know we are good for binding some stuff up I bind in the name of, we are good for that but do we really understand what we are saying when we say what we say do we really understand and take stock of the fact that we are literally able by the word of God by the power of the authority that is in him to be able to speak a word and to declare a thing and that it would be done mm. Because we're talking here about what? Satan and driving out Satan. Mm-hmm. And so what we have here are a couple of things. Mm. A couple of things that we have. We have one, Jesus is very, because the scribes brought it up, but Jesus makes it clear Satan is real. Don't play with that. Uh, Satan is real. Uh, he's a real being and he has his, a real kingdom, which is why he's referring to then he can plunder his house. But we don't, we don't bind up anything. We bind by the name of Jesus. Jesus does the binding, right? So Jesus is not, so what he's telling the scribes, I'm not working with Satan. I'm not working with, by the power of Beelzebub. No, no, that's ridiculous. And that is stupid, basically, is what he's saying. And so what Jesus, what Mark is doing here is continuing to reaffirm who Jesus is as, as being Messiah, as being the son of God. And so Jesus ain't working beside Satan. He ain't working with Satan. And at the end of the day, he is coming against Satan. And that's what he's saying through all of this right here. 
Satan is a strong man. He is the strong man in the parable. But Jesus is saying, mm -mm, but I promise I'm stronger. I, I promise I have more power. I promise that my authority is over all of creation to include Satan. And the fact that he was able to uh, call out demons and the fact that he was able to defeat evil spirits was the evidence that was uh, already out there proving that he was on the Lord's side, that he was an agent of righteousness, that he was sent by God as God's son, as the Messiah, and that he and he alone has the power and the authority to free people from their oppression, free people from sin, free people from diseases, free people from demonic possession possession, all of those things that would have folks in bondage. And my God, he can do the same thing today. All of that come to 2023. He can do the same thing today. But we got to know whose power and authority we are walking in. And then it's not our own. And, and let's be clear. Mm, I've got to move on, but let's be clear. We got to look at how Jesus spent his time. Help us, God. Jesus, Jesus spent his time in constant prayer and in the presence of God. Jesus, of course, is the Logos, the word of God. And so what makes us think, mm, help us, help us, help us, that we can um, stand up and against the enemy and his imps in our own flesh, in our own ability and think that we would be able to call down heaven and we ain't been in his face we haven't been in his word we haven't been meditating on his word we need to be careful with that that's all i'm saying because the strong man is strong but he is not stronger than jesus we just need to make sure that we're cultivating our personal relationship with jesus that we're cultivating our um our ability to discern what it is that God would have us to do. Because I promise every fight is not your fight and every assignment is not your assignment or mine, right? Let's go to the last section. The last section is warning, verses 28 through 30. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an internal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now, this is Jesus. He continues to talk. And Jesus makes it really clear. He says, truly, I tell you, you know, when Jesus starts off with truly or very verily or truly, I tell stop. Make sure you're paying close attention to what it is that he is about to say, right? And this is, the section is called what? Warning. And that's what this is. And then, and for those scribes who had already spoken and said that Jesus is of the Beelzebul, they were already in this position, which is a scary thought. Jesus says, People will be forgiven for all sins. Listen, the forgiver of sins says people will be forgiven of all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. What's a blasphemy? In general, it's the sin that involves speaking against God. That is a blasphemy. There's also um, places in scripture where we see that someone is um, defaming God's character or lying about him. Those are blasphemies. And that would also include what was taking place during the this time as the religious leaders were, you know, making their commentary um, and talking about Jesus and demonic activity and he is of Beelzebub and all of that. But those who deny Jesus as the Messiah are also considered blasph blasphemous as well. So there's a lot of different ways that we could potentially blaspheme against God. But we need to take a note. 
And then we're going to look at one scripture, which I think will help us as well. But he, so he gives us this statement in verse number 28. He says, truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven of all sins and whatever blasphemies they've uttered. And I just gave you an example of a myriad of different things. But then in verse number 29, there is a but. He says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is, is guilty of eternal sin. This is the unforgivable sin. Now, we're going to look at this a couple of different ways. Um, this, in one sense, it has to do with the consistent rejection of who God is in the person of Jesus Christ and the saving power that comes with the person of Jesus Christ. It could also be an attitude of hostility and that attitude of hostility would eventually lead you to this point of rejecting who God is in Jesus. It's the ongoing posture, it's the consistent unbelief and of course we know that at a certain point that unbelief will harden your heart and the Bible tells us I believe in Romans that and then he turned them over to a what a reprobate mind. Um, and, and we can get to a place where we reject and reject and rebel and rebel so much so that then we don't even have a desire anymore to even seek him, to even seek repentance. And of course, if there is no repentance, then there is no forgiveness. But let's look at it another way as well. Um, and this mode of thought um, I did find um, in a teaching by our brother John MacArthur because let's go back to the word blaspheme at some point we were all blasphemers right because we didn't believe and we, we rejected God right but thank God then we heard the word we received the word we embraced the word we confessed our sins right and we became saved we became Christians right but it's that hardened heart part that is what? Concerning. And what that becomes is a willful, intentional blindness. That consistency that I talked about earlier. We're still not all the way there. Mm -hmm. We're still not all the way there. The, the other side of that is if after you've been given or you've been or receive the full revelation of who Jesus is. You've received the revelation, but your final response, your conclusionary statement is that Jesus is demonic or Jesus is filled with an unclean spirit. It is that form of rejection that then lends itself to um, the unpardonable sin. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is, he gu is guilty of eternal sin. Listen to, this is Jesus. That's what he said. And then in verse number 30, then he explains what he just said. And what he says is because they were saying, speaking of the scribes, and so he's referring to what they said in reference to the people that he's speaking to that will receive forgiveness only if they don't do what? Say that he has an unclean spirit, speaking of Jesus. Say that he is, because we know that we just talked about this last week, I believe, that an unclean spirit, if we say someone um, is has an unclean spirit, that's the same thing as saying that they are possessed by a demon they, they, they hold the same what weight right and so Jesus says here they they he says um, they were saying they were saying in verse number 30 because they were saying and they didn't just say it one time they kept on saying and I said it earlier that the scribes the Sadducees the Pharisees they kept the lie alive they consistently pointed back to he has an unclean that's all they had and so they decided they would try to use that for leverage to be able to um, 
to stifle um, Jesus's reputation, to destroy his character, um, and which then would, even though the miracles were taking place, the the people were being you know delivered and healed and all that, that they would shot they would. Uh, shadow or cast a dark light on what Jesus had done because the onus was not from God the onus was not from a place of righteousness but they were saying that the onus was a place was from a place of evil and demonic reference so that's the difference you can look at it as consistent consistency but that consistency at a certain point will bear itself out in being the final answer, the consistent rejecting, the consistent rebelling, the consistency that then leads to you don't even want to hear about Jesus anymore. Come on, somebody. Jesus makes it clear. They were saying he has an unclean spirit. I hope y'all are getting that. I hope y'all are getting that because at the end of the day, what are we talking about? We're talking about um, Jesus says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. And part of that is because what did I say earlier? That you receive the full revelation, but you have determined that your final response is that that revelation is not true and Jesus is possessed by a demon. He has an unclean spirit. Well, the reality is it's the Holy Spirit who calls us. It is the Holy Spirit who woos us to him. It is the Holy Spirit that helps us with the power of the word to come into uh, faith and belief in Christ because we don't come in and of ourselves. We come through the power of the Holy Spirit with the word of God. And so we see this demonstrated mm -hmm, throughout the text, but we have to make sure that we get that connection of what God, Jesus, is saying here. I want to read one scripture for you as we get ready to wind this up. But, but what we have to make sure we understand is that we, we did not come out the womb saved. Mm -hmm. We've all been forgiven. We have all confessed our sins, but then our hope in Jesus Christ. And so a hallelujah ought to go right there. A hallelujah ought to go right there. The challenge is, mm, the challenge is when we sit in this beautiful sanctuary, we receive the word day in and day out, but yet we don't desire to change we, we 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 don't desire to have a closer walk with him we we keep doing things the same way and we keep going through the motions and and thinking that that's all right and Jesus said that ain't all right <laughs> because if I say I'm saved I ought to walk like I'm saved if I say I'm saved I ought to talk like I'm saved if I say that I'm saved then there ought to be a difference and a transformation that has taken place in my life. Let me give you some scriptures real quick. I'm going to read one because I want you to hear from our brother Paul as it relates to this blaspheming piece. But let me just give you a couple of scriptures as well because I'm not going to have time to read them. As it relates to this third section warning, there are um, other parallel gospel stories of this same pericope. One is going to be in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, look at verses 31 and 32, in particular 32. Also Luke, you can also look at Luke chapter 12 verse 10, and this is related to the eternal sin part. And then also you can look at 1 John chapter 5 verses 16 through 17. And then you can also go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 32. Mm, let me see if I have time. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 32. And then also Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. And then also Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. And that Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 um, talks talks about the the drifting away I'm not gonna go there but th th that's that verse talks about the drifting away and then Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4 talks about the peril of falling away mm. but what I want to read for us though is first Timothy chapter 1 
verse 12 and 13, we'll say 12 and 13. So this is Paul. He says, I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Listen, even though I was a former blasphemer, a persecutor and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. So what is Paul saying? I have, to, I have to keep moving. Paul is saying what we're saying here in this text. He was ignorant. He didn't know what he was doing. What Mark is saying is that if you have received the full revelation of who Jesus Christ is, and yet you still come to the conclusion that what we've already talked about, that is the unpardonable, unforgivable sin. Paul here is, uh, to a degree, giving us the converse of his resume. You know, we read oftentimes in, uh, I believe it's in Romans, where he'll talk about, you know, all the things that he has accomplished. But here he's talking about the fact that he was a former blasphemer. He was a persecutor of the church. He killed Christians, right? He said he was a man of violence. Then he says, but I received mercy. Go back to what... Jesus said in verse number 28 of our text, truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemes they utter. But, I have to stop there. But, I want you all to see the difference between what Jesus is referring to, which is forgivable, versus what Jesus is referring to that is not forgivable. Forgivable. So at the end of the day, I'm going to quote just one statement from my brother, John MacArthur. He says, don't turn away. Listen, don't turn away. Get the full revelation and respond in full trust. Next Sunday, we'll be in Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 44. The title of the lesson is Satisfies satisfies. Don't go anywhere. Our pastor will be with us in just a moment. And actually, no, it won't be our pastor. This is the celebration of our 40th, for our pastor, 40th pastoral anniversary. And we are excited, excited about it. So stay tuned. Stay right where you are. We will be blessed in just a moment with a powerful word from the Lord. Be blessed. <music> 